Okay, I think we will slowly, slowly start. Um, welcome to the Sound Arts Lecture Series hosted here at the London College of Communication in association with CRISAP, which as you know is the Creative Research into Sound Arts Practice Center also um, here at LCC. And my name is Mark Peter Wright. I'm the acting course leader for the BA Sound Arts course and a member of CRISAP as well. And I'm really thrilled and delighted that we've got Anna Frist with us today, um, who's going to be sharing her wonderful work. Um, and I'm going to introduce Anna shortly. Um, but as always, I have some things for us um, to go through, some housekeeping things first. So I'll go through these um, yet again. And just as a reminder, I think for us, it's, it's, it's special this series because it's an important mixing of undergraduate, postgraduate students, and also members of the public who can come and experience and engage with contemporary artists and researchers. So it's a very unique um, shared space, which, which is lovely. Um, can we have the next slide, Rory? Me, thank you. Um, so within this mix, I always remind everyone, like if you're a UAL student, can you just make sure you've got your full name as your username for registration purposes? And a reminder that this is only for pre-registered external guests. So if we can't identify you, you will be asked to leave the session. Um, next slide, Rory, thanks. And the chat messaging function is archived. That's always my own way of remembering that this is a public forum. Um, microphones are off automatically, I think. And um, if it's not on this, we recommend speak of you. Um, because it's a long and relaxed kind of slow afternoon. So um, it's always nice to have to speak of you on. And just a reminder that the sessions are recorded. And again, that does include the chat messages. Um, next slide, Rory, thanks. For students, um, this is your attendance for today. If you want to scan the QR code, you can. Um, the password you can see hopefully is 48GAB5. I'll put that in the chat afterwards. If you can't scan for whatever reason, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, next slide, please, Rory. Just a reminder that this is a great space to ask questions to practitioners. And again, we always sort of stress that a question can be just wanting to know more about something. It doesn't have to be incredibly complex. So um, I always encourage you to put your questions in the chat as we go. Um, use the chat as a kind of continual memory log as well if you need to. It's always nice to kind of use that space, that para space. Um, if you want to ask your question, you can indicate that in the, in the chat. I might do a private message to you. Um, if you don't want to, I'll just pick it up and, and relay that question for you. So do use the, the chat uh, function for questions. Okay, and one next slide, please, Rory. One other formal little bit. This is just for students, really. Just to make sure that you know where the links are every week, because the website, the internal website has changed. Um, you'll notice this box, the Sound Arts Lecture Series, which is like a box, a specific box that takes you to this, um, description about the lecture series and in there is a link where you can find all the sessions for the autumn term and the links are already there as well so if ever in doubt everything is in the Moodle page for students you effectively you don't need communication you can you can get all of the links there for the whole of the autumn term okay let's get on some exciting juicy stuff now so next slide please Rory we've got Anna with us today and I'm I'm an actual fan, I'll just admit that now. So that's out in the air. Um, I'm just gonna read Anna's bio and then let Anna take over from here. So Anna Fritz is a sound, transmission and media artist, media studies scholar. Her work reflects upon media ecologies, infrastructure and environment, time, perception, radio and transmission art histories and critical fictions with a focus on listening, improvisation, site specificity and repurposing technologies. 
Since 1998, she's created self-reflexive radio for broadcast, installation, or performance, where radio is the source, subject, and medium of the work. She also creates large-scale audiovisual installations and composes for film, theater, and contemporary dance. Her most recent works include the outdoor transmission sculpture, Solar Radio, with absolute value of noise at Wave Farm, New York, the 22-hour live radio performance, Fog Refrain, and We Build Ruins, a series of mixed media artworks expressively considering mining and industrial corridors in the high altitude deserts in Northern Chile. Anna is currently Associate Professor of Sound in the Film and Digital Media Department at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And with that, I say thank you again, Anna, and I, I hand the floor to you as it were. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for having me. Welcome, everyone. Um, I was going to say good morning, but that's only relevant for me sitting here on the West Coast. Um, there may be um, uh, an, uh, a visual sunrise that happens a little bit here uh, over the course of my time with you because um, um, I'm kind of near a window, so there might be this lighting change as the sun rises. Um, but I feel like this is sort of in, uh, what should we say, like in, in keeping with, uh, with some of the work that I'm going to show, because a lot of the work that I'm interested in um, expanding or that I've been preoccupied with also includes thinking about different sorts of diurnal rhythms and seasonal rhythms, um, as well as um, working in ways that are uh, site-specific or considering uh, particular kinds of electromagnetic spaces as well as um, emplacement in a geographic sense. Um, so I'll just say a couple of words about my background um, before I get started playing some things. Um, I, uh, uh, I began working with sound um, as a in my early 20s in community radio in Vancouver in Canada and uh, I feel like the working in the studio was really my my first opportunity to begin to get my hands on um, on on the means of sonic production, which at that time in the early 90s was, of course, entirely analog. So it was literally a practice of uh, learning by by hand how to edit sound and how to craft uh, audio pieces. And I very much thought of the studio as a performative space. Um, in at uh, CITR Radio in Vancouver, where I began, we had uh, production studios that were an exact copy of the on-air booth, so that you know any any volunteer would be able to kind of transfer their skills very easily from one space to the next. And um, because we only had two-track reel-to-reel -reel machines in order to record to, if I was composing something that had um, sort of numerous layers of sound and material, I had to kind of perform it through the production board. So I would have tapes queued up or uh, carts with uh, small samples. So a cart machine being, you know, something akin to an eight track, but uh, but just uh, being a small stereo track, uh, endlessly winding, re-queuing tape cartridge. Um, eventually, you know, we had the, um, the the newfangled technology of mini disc and that sort of thing, um, and also access to multiple turntables. And so, um, I very much began as somebody who was used to addressing an unseen audience and um, and kind of performing all the layers of sound that I would need um, to create or realize a piece. And this habit has really stuck with me. And so I was thinking as I was choosing some sounds to play for you today, um, in some ways, how little has changed for me since this in, uh, sort of initial practice was crafted in, um, in the radio studio, which is that I still think very performatively about sound. Improvisation is still uh, uh, a really key part. And, um, and the sense of, um, of kind of lining up layers and then um, and then making a piece in real time um, is very much uh, the way that I, I I'm working on things now. Uh, I've in the inter intervening decades had a lot of opportunities to present sound in different kinds of contexts from 
being in you know quite odd or industrial uh, site specific locations, doing micro radio projects that are out in the field, um, to to being inside of different sorts of um, installation locations, uh, concert venues, odd bunkers, etc. Um, and I feel it's worth mentioning that the the pandemic time really pushed me back into a radio mindset, and that of course has to do with being um being in lockdown being at home um everyone switching to a kind of online mode for me also as a professor both teaching as well as presenting work and um so i've become very preoccupied with radiophonic questions um uh, or should i say those have been pushed back into the foreground whereas i would uh, i would say that maybe for the last 10 years um, I've more had a radiophonic sensibility than I have been actively making radio work. But now in these last year or two, um, the radiophonic has really returned to the fore. So as a way to get started, um, uh, let's play a piece. Uh, I have a short piece that kind of lays out some of my current interests around transmission. Um, this was a, a short 10 minute um, um, segment that was a part of a group installation created uh, for um, an exhibition in at the Espace Gantner in Belfort, uh, France. It was curated by Pali Merceau. And um, the question was really to, to uh, um, a number of artists were invited to think about their positionality on transmission. And so uh, I've made a little short piece that includes some of my thoughts. And then the um, it's enmeshed in a sonic uh, bed uh, made from a number of existing pieces that I've created over the years either solo or together with other collaborators, such as uh, Emmanuel Madan or um, Absolute Value of Noise. And so in each case, these are uh, pieces that reflect on some different part of signal space and radio space. Uh, so let's see if I can succeed in sharing this with you. Um, when um, some of the time when we're listening to pieces, you probably will see a kind of, um, misty oceanscape on my desktop, which is a photograph from here in Santa Cruz. And um, and I've kind of chosen that just so that it, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the piece. It's just sort of uh, allows us to listen and not really have to look at things too much. Um, so just don't feel like you're, you're trying to figure out what the meaning is there. It's just, um, it's a bit more of like an ambient, um, um, an, an ambient space for listening. Um, Okay. Here we go. The notion of ecology typically describes relationships between organisms, opening the category of active agents to more than organisms, allows for ecology also to describe non-living but material things and systems of things. In this sense, communication systems are part of environments, and environments are also media. American 1586, contact Toronto Center, 
Transmission ecologies can refer to both the symbolic spaces of cultural production, like a radio station, and to the invisible and the very material space of dynamic electromagnetic interaction, both of which feature the collaboration between people and things. American 1118, this is 6,000. United 1108, Toronto on the way to level 250, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Angle flight 275, ready to go down. Eagle flight 274, maintain level 240. American 1118, there's no restrictions, this is 3,000 for an 8 mile final. Under another 6, 3 mile, uh, 3,000, American 1118. A transmission ecology could also be defined by the set of radio receivers tuned to a particular station in a single urban area, or by all the activity across the various frequencies on the electromagnetic spectrum that you could sense from one particular location. Radio frequencies are a means of sensing and knowing bodies at a distance. Thinking ecologically demonstrates that transmission and communication is not a game of one-to-many broadcast radiating out from an antenna, nor is it a polarity of senders and receivers, but always a many-to-many -many field of relationships. Thinking ecologically about transmission considers processes of relationship and power the dangers of the monocrop, the monopoly, and the logics of the grid. In the organic sense of ecologies, thinking about transmission invites thinking about how seeds travel, like broadcasting and of the relay networks employed by plants underground. Forests are communal formations with their tree roots connected under the soil in mycorrhizal networks. The very fine root tips of trees join together with microscopic fungal filaments to form the basic links of the network, operating in symbiotic relationships between trees and fungi, allowing hub or mother trees to share nutrients and to communicate with one another with chemical and electrical signals. Trees, like humans, engage in something like wired and wireless communications over distance. The transmission of plants include the root networks underground, or the sensitivity of leaves to sense and scent, and to the casting of seeds. Broadcasting in a radiophonic sense originates from the agricultural term for planting that involves casting seeds broadly at the ground. A seed is no more a container than a radio is. It is not merely tasked with carrying the message of a plant's inheritance to receptive ground. A seed is action over distance. It is a body-seeking influence, listening when and where they land for the circumstances of the ground. The seed encounters good conditions for germination, oxygen, water, temperature, light, and awakens in a gesture that is visually a little like a radio receiver unfolding its antenna. The seed puts out a small root followed by a tiny stem, 
sensing and receiving from its environment. From the particularity of a single seed comes not a universal story, but a common one. In each seed resides a generous potential for a plant to germinate, or for a creature to be fed, or for its unrealized germination to become part of the earth. Likewise, radio broadcasting is a remarkable, promiscuous gift of plenitude. Practically, broadcast radio doesn't know who is listening, so the signal is for anyone who cares to. For a listener, the radio is both generally and specifically intended for you. A seed is a possibility for relationships that include the historical, the contemporary, and the imaginary. But seeds spread beyond the fields to which they were originally confined. And likewise, radio signals may also exhibit feral behaviors find transmissions overlapping or multiplying across the spectrum. Fields may seem the opposite of wilderness, but fields of influence may quickly return to the wild. There are many overlapping ecologies, and the irreducible condition of wirelessness is not space overcome, but it is place multiplied. Waves, fields, roots, seeds. Right, so that gives you a little bit of um, an introduction to some of the themes that I would say are uh, of continual preoccupation in, over the last two, uh, several decades, couple of decades for me. Um, so I'm I'm really interested in thinking um, about media ecologies in the sense of ecology more broadly. I'm very um, I'm very drawn to thinking about depth in terms of things that are underground as well as in the air, sort of in the in the sort of atmospheric sense, um, and also the sort of surface tensions that are in this space. Part of this uh, comes from spending a lot of time listening to uh, just across the various radio bands and and into these um, um, areas of of kind of spurious noise, rhythmic um, rhythmic sorts of interferences, harmonic interferences, where sound can kind of thin out and then thicken again in a way that feels very much like encountering the surface of an ocean or the surface of land that then you can plunge into or or or, or kind of become um, immersed inside of. So this, this simultaneous aspect of there being a skin or a surface and then there also being a depth is, is something that um, I really experienced in a, in a, in a practice of listening to signal and now deeply informs how I work with field recording and field-based uh, observational research when I'm um, in the desert or uh, or here on the west coast um, working in the fog zone for instance. Also embodiment is really important to me. I really take issue with the notion that the the radiophonic voice is somehow disembodied. I feel like nothing could be more incorrect. The embodiment is being shared across a lot of different technological systems, uh, but there are bodies everywhere in the voice, uh, beginning with the fact that you couldn't possibly inhabit uh, your voice if you had not inhabited your body at a particular historical, cultural um, uh, moment. Um, and, and everything about a voice, everything about the way I use my voice is, is cultured by my experience of being in a body at this particular time and place. So that in combination with the sometimes invisible seeming um, technologies creates a lot of material embodiment um, involved with, with radio especially. 
And so if anything, I seek to highlight this. You'll notice when I use walkie talkies, I, I don't try to hide my breath, for instance. In fact, I do the opposite. I kind of misuse them so that there's a snort of breath or there's evidence of my breathing corporeal self inside of this uh, space of, 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 of sonic imaginary or, or um, sonic bridging that, uh, that radio can allow. I've also been continually interested with this initial question again raised by radio and, and one that I explore across a lot of different sorts of media artworks, which is uh, an experience of distance. Um, in communications media, there has so often been this insistence on uh, a desire to, to overcome distance or to bridge distance. And uh, as, as um, the piece that I just played for you ends, ends with, it's, I think what's more interesting is in fact to have an experience of distance and to think not of the idea of collapsing places into one another, but in fact, multiplying the emplacement one might experience. Um, and this interplay between being in a space, a sort of, uh, and, and one that is spatialized, with emplacement or the the notion of, of developing meaning and relationship with with um, with geography, but also with with an imaginary space is is really um, an ongoing preoccupation. So, um, with all that kind of um, issue in mind, um, I'd like to take us to a slightly different um, uh, kind of listening space that also relates to. Um, I suppose my experience in the last couple of years, as we all have, of, of having these fraught relations of near and far and um, proximity, distance, intimacy, lack thereof, isolation, and so on. Um, and one of the things that I've also turned to not only um, is radio, but a particular kind of radio, really listening a lot more to um, uh, the world of two-way radio, or what my colleague Rick Prellinger calls uh, useful radio, which is the space of labor and, um, and kind of practical communications, um, daily habitual chit-chat, whether it's the radio that uh, we heard a little snippet of in the previous piece of um, air-to-ground communications for air traffic control, whether it's um, security systems or people who are moving the subway trains around in the San Francisco Bay Area, it's the BART train operators, or um, or it's uh, ham operators, or myself on a walkie-talkie speaking with someone else, or, you know, using it in an art piece. I'm interested in this, um, this possibility of, of so-called useful radio, because it's a, it's a way of digging into the evidence of, of, uh, of labor and of human presence in a particular place without necessarily looking at, you know, the street traffic or the other kinds of obvious evidence that one might see. And it's interesting for me to overlay this with other kinds of creature signals and think about like layers of, um, um, of signal space that are acoustic and electromagnetic that are occurring in sort of in an interplay. So a recent piece that uh, I worked on uh, or a performance, um, as as many many artists did in uh, in the summer, was uh, a commission for uh, Radio Art Zone in Sir uh, Elset in Luxembourg. Um, Knut Alferman and Sarah Washington curated 100 Days of Radio Art, and so many of us were invited to create a 22 hour uh, 22 hours of programming, which we could do in any way we saw fit. So many people invited others to perform and play with them. Um, some people did uh, made beautiful, completely pre-recorded pieces. And then there was a smaller number of us who chose to come to Esh and create live performed pieces that were 22 hours long. So um, I created a piece called Fog Refrain, which, uh, which was a 22 hour performance. So I did manage to stay awake for the whole time and um, I was working with the notion of signals and uh, acoustic and electromagnetic signal space within the fog line here on the California coast. And so I was choosing, um, I live in Santa Cruz, which is just uh, a little bit below San Francisco in the Bay Area, but uh, but it's sort of considered part of the greater Bay Area, let's say from uh, San, uh, Santa Cruz County up to Sonoma County. 
and um, and the fog here is a really important feature in terms of its character, but even more so in terms of the uh, the way that plants and the environment um, receive water. So even right now, I can see as uh, outside the window, it's beginning to lighten, and there's a very foggy day out there this morning. Um, typically at this time of year, the marine layer, as it's called, rolls in in the late afternoon, uh, early evening, and um, and just sort of coats coats the land. Um, and this fog zone can can stretch some kilometers inland. Um, here, it's a fairly narrow one at the moment. It's also the area where the coastal redwoods are located, and the redwoods almost entirely receive their moisture from the fog. So they are excellent expert fog catchers. And uh, redwood forests are very good at tr sort of transmuting that water, bringing it down into the ground um, for other, other plants. Um, so the fog is, is a super important part of this ecosystem. And of course, because of climate change and the climate crisis, uh, the fog has been slowly disappearing. So there's about 35% less fog than there would have been in, in the past. Um, also, we're in a time of extreme drought here, um, although there aren't there haven't been any uh, forest fires just immediately around here and this year. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a very severe fire, which um, uh, caused us all to evacuate, and um, many of my colleagues lost their homes. And the forests are very much still in recovery. So in this kind of sear dry landscape, the fog is this balm it's in, and it really does account for most of the moisture that plants receive during the year. So the fog has this characteristic that is um, about establishing place here. And at the same time, fog, much like working with sound, is a tremendously ambiguous uh, medium. It has this kind of delightful instability where it's difficult to really pin down its form, although it very much has habits as it interacts with the landscape. Like the places where fog will pour through a, a, a small notch in, in a series of hills um, creates this kind of regular um, um, expression of fog meeting land and the places where tendrils of fog will kind of pour over into the city or the sort of gaps in which it will inhabit. And then, of course, this space has a long history of trying to navigate in that fog. So there are fog beacons and, um, and fog horns. Mostly I was interested in fog beacons because those were both radiophonic and acoustic. So in the 1930s, for instance, in order to help navigate into the entrance to the San Francisco Bay, uh, there were Morse code beacons that were um, you, could, you could hear via radio that would just use a small one or two letter Morse code um, for specific points along the coast. And they would re be repeating constantly on that channel. So a boat would be able to tell, oh, okay, if I can hear these three different beacons, I can triangulate my position. And at the same time now there are, um, those Morse code beacons meanwhile are no longer functional here, um, but they, um, there are acoustic fog beacons that are triggered when there's a certain amount of uh, moisture in the air, like a certain percentage of moisture or condensation in the air. And then of course, once the fog actually reaches the level of the ocean surface, so there's enough fog that's actually coming right down to the, the surface of the water, then there are fog horns which, um, which go off. Uh, but these fog beacons are ones that you hear very often, and they're they're usually at the entrance to, you know, a small bay or inlet where boats, especially small craft, might be going in and out who have less um, advanced um, sensing equipment. And so all of this adds to uh, an environment of um, uh, uh, of of foggy activity. And in my twenty two hour piece, I I worked with field recordings and with um, um, entirely from inside of this fog line of, of creatures and people and evidence of weather, as well as this electromagnetic sphere of um, you know, workers using radio for moving trains around and directing traffic and um, you know, dealing with the sort of everyday needs of, of an urban space. Um, so uh, I'd like to play a little piece of that because it also, um, it, it's a 22 hour piece. It's really hard to choose a small, small section. Um, I'll also say because the durational aspect really introduces a certain kind of uh, slow unfolding of things. 
I really was able to abandon any idea of a radio grid, um, which has always been um, important to me to kind of subvert the notion of rigid timekeeping. But um, with this piece, I, I truly didn't even have to do station IDs if I didn't feel like it. So, um, so even though I was being broadcast on a, a large uh, uh, community station in Luxembourg and being rebroadcast by Resonance FM and um, uh, Resonance Extra and 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 other stations. I, I really could just lean into allowing something to unfold for the period of time that it seemed to need and then just wait until I felt an impulse to change something and then do so. So um, it was uh, it it is difficult to kind of convey that pacing in a short segment, but I will try to do so. Um, let's see if I can manage to share again. We will uh, return to our little foggy image of the um, um, of this whale. The nice thing about this uh, image I have on my desktop that you can see is that this is a real humpback whale in Santa Cruz feeding on a lot of fish. So, and there you can kind of see the marine layer in this image too. So we're sort of in the right space. Okay, so this little segment um, came from part of the middle of the night part of the broadcast, the sort of like 2 a.m. section. And um, as you can see, I have a real love of walkie talkies at the moment. So, um, well, I kind of always do, I've just returned to it. Um, so there's a, there's a, just a bit more of this radio space and this walkie talkie space.
So that kind of um, dense nighttime working environment is very um, just really interesting to me because of uh, also being able to follow the small dramas of what happens when you're moving all the trains, when the trains are stopped between 1.30 and 5, five o'clock in the morning. So there's like sticky things to, to clean up. There's, you know, difficulty moving train cars around. There's... Um, each person has just a real kind of radio personality. Uh, I can also hear after, you know, I had hours and hours of these overnight recordings from the, the BART train, um, the Bay Area Rapid Transit uh, overnight workers. Um, it's just on shortwave. It, you know, anybody can be picking it up. So um, or I guess uh, it's rebroadcast by somebody on shortwave who's actually listening on a UHF VHF radio. But in any case, it's on a public channel. It's not encoded. We're not snooping. It's 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 just sort of publicly available, and it's just kind of evidence of people working. And um, and after listening for a couple of hours, I kind of got quite invested in these different characters, um, um, the sort of jokes they were telling one another. Um, you know, who who had something for lunch that didn't agree with them, or you know, oh, we sort of lost that one car. Let's move it around some more. Um, trying to imagine what this world was in which people were working overnight every night, um, and it was just a different kind of expression of urban or high density human um, life than than um, than the kind of usual visual element of you know, car traffic and commuting and people going into offices or people going into factories or something of this sort. It's like a different quality of, um, of, of, of expression of that. Um, and then um, I'd like to play something kind of completely different, but um, this has a little bit of video to it, but that also expresses some of my interest in the, the non-human side of all of these signals. This is actually from a different project. This is from a live performance that I did in um, October of 2020 for a Santa Cruz um, uh, cultural organization called Indexical, who are fantastic uh, local organizers of experimental music concerts and uh, outdoor happenings. And uh, this piece was called Outside, which I made at a point when I was not outside as much as I would have liked for a number of reasons. One of, you know, having been in quarantine for quite a while. And then the other of, um, this was the era of the, the, the CZU fire here. And so between the um, evacuation and then just the terrible air quality from the, the, the ongoing fires, one was really trapped indoors. And also we had a heat wave on top of that. So, you know, at some points in the afternoon, of, you know, let's say 3 p.m. in the middle of the summer, it's the, the visual equivalent of Mars, you know, this dark red sky, very, very smoky and very hot. So I started making um, some small incursions into my tiny, tiny little backyard and the small meadow that's behind it and kind of the some of the features nearby where there's a lot of underground activity. There are gophers, you know, small rodents living underground um, who sort of create holes and are kind of creating a, a sort of gopher scape um, in, in the area. Uh, there's just a lot of interesting insects that started showing up because of the drought and um, 
um, these Jerusalem crickets, which are kind of look like in my imagination, almost like some sort of giant termite queen, except they're they're kind of an innocuous bug. They just look a bit horrifying, you know, false tarantulas, things like this. Like there's just a lot of underground creatures, um, beetles and so on, cleaning up all of the mulch and the, the kind of rotting things that are left behind at that time of year. Um, that part of late summer, early fall in this part of California is really the time when things are dormant. That's sort of like uh, if winter is a time when things are, are are kind of sterile, this is the time here when it's hot and dry and everything just goes into a sort of dormancy. So, um, so I created this live performance with video where I was performing from home for an audience who were all like you listening. Uh, we were using Twitch. Um, so there was a video I had filmed that day in my house and then I was doing live sound to it. So we'll just hear a little tiny piece of it um, that will kind of give you a sense of, you know, if we've just been listening to what's in the air, here's some of what's um, what's going on underground. Um, so bear with me while I choose the correct thing here. Um, let's see. Can folks see a dark image at the moment? Oh, okay. Let me let me try that again. Let me just this is this thing I've made it very complicated for myself. Um there we go. I think now we have the correct thing. Okay, perfect. So we'll we'll listen, we'll we'll watch and listen to a, the sort of end section of this.
So, so this piece sort of still, as you can tell, is still using electronics and, and a kind of radiophonic sensibility to some degree, but very much thinking of the space of the underground and the insectoid. And um, um, it also included segments where I'm kind of roaming around um, investigating drains inside the house and uh, and the outflows from the the roof like the, the the sort of gutter system and things like this so uh, always I, I always have my eye on infrastructure to some degree because I'm um, quite preoccupied with the ways in which also like um, uh, kind of almost unnoticed the unnoticeable aspects of the built environment, like the things that seem very familiar or very common, um, how those how those speak to different ideas of worlding, and and how those kinds of infrastructures um, tell stories about power, but also can be inhabited in different ways, particularly when when they begin to break down. So this was very much at a moment when I was feeling the breakdown of. Um, and, and the kinds of failures here to address climate crisis and 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 feeling very much like crime, climate crisis was upon us, um, and and then also thinking very much about what are the other what are some of the other what's the perspective of another scale of creature another size of creature that has a different relationship to the porousness of going inside and outside and being able to be underground and that's moving through these these sort of crumbling aspects of infrastructure that are meant to deal with water, but there's no water in them. So there's no water in the drains and uh, there isn't any water running off the roof and there's nothing in this sort of culvert because we're in the driest time, in the smokiest time and in, in this sort of ash filled moment. So 
Um, it was uh, a chance for me to think about what what the stories of infrastructure tell in these kind of poetic and, and maybe sometimes uh, uh, kind of alarming ways. Um, so just to make a, a small pivot now to uh, I've been really thinking a lot about um, radio and transmission systems. And so a large project that I'm working on is is not as uh, obviously concerned with this, although it certainly does include these um, notions of emplacement and um, um, and considering land and infrastructure and very much addressing the industrialization of um, of communication, maybe from the back end, let's say, which is uh, I've been engaged in um, uh, for the last five years in a project um, exploring the deserts in Chile, um, in, in Atacama, which is in the northern section of Chile, um, uh, bordering um, to Peru and Bolivia in the in the north and northeast, and then uh, and then Argentina um, to the to sort of a little bit further east. And it's this area that people know about because um, it's where the uh, ALMA um, telescopic array is, this international installation of, um, of really high power telescopes that are mounted there because it's one of the driest places on earth. It's very high altitude. You have this kind of incredible opportunity for star viewing, even just with your own eyes. It's really an astonishing place for this. Um, it's also a place that historically has been fought over in colonial times um, as, uh, as a site of, of extraction. So there was this history, long history of saltpeter mining. Um, and then also there has been this uh, uh, ongoing um, um, last century of, of just sort of massive radical copper mining and lithium mining. And so this, uh, this area um, has just undergone um, a real transformation because of these industries. And these are also the key ingredients for all of the kinds of equipment that I use as a media maker. None, none of my gear would work if it didn't have batteries and copper wire and, um, and the demand under the pandemic has only increased this considerably. And so each time I return to the same area with my collaborator, uh, Rodrigo Rios Zunino, and, uh, and we're recording and filming around these mines, we can see that the scope of them is just expanding and expanding. So the desert is being really transformed there. Again, a really dry, very tough, but also very fragile place. Um, and it's a space of geological time and mineral durations because it is simply um, such a kind of open, very minimalistic landscape in some ways in terms of uh, the kinds of organisms that occupy there. Um, it's not the same as being in the Northwest Coast rainforest that I grew up with, which, you know, the, the horizon is like sort of right in front of your face in terms of just the, the riot of foliage and, and, and plants and creatures. But in, um, in the Atacama Desert, you can see extremely far away. And so sometimes, the desert really plays tricks on a uh, on someone who has not grown up there. So someone like myself, who has been a visitor over many years, um, th th simply the scale of the mountains makes one doubt that they could be so far away. It's like, oh, that mountain's just nearby. It's like, well, actually, that's about eighty kilometers away because the mountain is so large that um, it seems as if it's nearby. Um, and and the desert is filled with mirage and. Um, and the the kind of sound world, the ambiguities that I really embraced in the kind of sound making I've engaged in, I'm now really applying to making images and filming, uh, creating films there, um, as well as continuing to work on audio pieces. So I want to play a little bit from from um, uh, a, a recent installation. It's a multi-channel installation that um, uh, we had uh, completed just before the pandemic began. It includes three screens and they have sort of three different elements to them. So one screen is very much um, uh, focused on the, the salt flats and, and the part of the, the desert that is, is not yet really um, transformed by human activity. It's immediately adjacent to an area of intensive lithium mining, um, but it still is, is this, uh, the, the the sort of the floor of the desert as it would um, as it would seem without um, without human activity, 
And this space is interesting because it once was the bottom of a sea, and now it is uh, at very high elevation. It's about 3,000 um, uh, meters above sea level and, uh, and is very arid. Although there is some flooding that occurs when there is runoff from the Andes that can sort of wash into this area. Um, and then also this is an area where uh, off-planet um, um, un unmanned um, technologies are tested. So for instance, the Mars Perseverance and the Mars rovers have been tested here in this environment as a, as a kind of analog for Mars. And, um, and in addition, the kind of mining that is being developed, particularly in the copper mines, um, in this sort of immediately adjacent area to the salt flats, um, is also more and more mechanized and um, needs fewer and fewer people to oversee its actual material happening. So uh, in many ways, this is a part of the world, um, like others, there are other sort of sites that, that are used as um, a staging ground uh, for the imagined um, imperial move off planet to mine on, moon, on the moon, mine on Mars. Um, these, these ideas of like how humans will, will move our kind of extractive uh, colonial dominion um, abroad uh, are very much being tested in this particular desert. So again, there's a vertical relationship here I was really interested in. Um, and I began my field work here by not really knowing all of this, like having some sense that there had been historical and, and contemporary mining, and that it was this place where there was a kind of connection to people being uh, able to view stars or other planets and also an interest in, in this outer space leap. But once I began spending time there, I realized this was actually like a much more complicated ground zero for Industrial Revolution 4.0, as they call it, uh, where there's really this in, in, um, kind of smashing together, actually, of, of global infrastructural systems and, um, and, uh, and a mindset around colonial extraction, as well as a really, a really robust environment that um, because you can see traces from things that have happened two million years ago, it's very easy to also imagine what two million years in the future might look like and to have a feeling that there is endurance on this planet, even though our current actions mean that there's a good chance that humans will, will not be part of that same endurance or certainly the kind of world that we're in now is not necessarily going to continue in the ways that we would have expected. So it's both uh, sobering, but also kind of heartening to, to be inside of a much larger, longer narrative at the same time that it's also this sort of urgent place where an immediate and, and destructive narrative is being played out. So, uh, so our piece, Solar, has, as I said, has th three screens, one of which is really about the section of the salt flats that are not being mined. One is... Um, um, a, a kind of continuous shot of a single mirage. And, uh, and the third is uh, evidence of the lithium mining that, uh, that takes place. And we were interested in the same kinds of estrangement that you might experience with sound in the ways that sounds uh, uh, elude their, their cause. Sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to be sure exactly where one sound is coming from, or is it caused by this? Is it caused by that? You know, this, this glorious ambiguity around sound, which enables Foley effects and cinematic filmmaking and all these sorts of things. Um, we were also playing with this visually so, so that there's an uncertainty about the scale or the quality of the things one is seeing. Is this very dry? Is this very wet? Like, what, what is it that I'm seeing? And we were very much thinking about these forces of hard and soft. So I'm gonna play you a chunk of, um, it's sort of a document of, of this, uh, this film. Um, we uh, normally present it with um, uh, nine to 12 channels of sound, which are um, a series of sort of asynchronous, um, um, short or long looping sections. And then these three videos, which are also on, on sort of different lengths of, of loop. So um, what you'll see represented are, are kind of like a linear uh, series of the three videos, and you'll hear like an edit of the sound. Um, and we won't experience the whole thing, obviously. Um, we'll just play a segment. Um, but this will kind of give you a sense of some of um, how I'm applying ideas that I have from sound and listening to also adding this, this element of, um, of image making. 
So let's make sure that I can properly share.
All right, I will stop there. Sorry for the abrupt stop, but it gives you a sense of um, some of the pacing of what we're working with when considering this desert space. Um, things unfold there very slowly. And so we're always in this mode of thinking about suspending time and um, bringing us into the space of, of sort of both a suspension and also a kind of urgency. Um, and, and very much, much thinking about these, these forces of the soft and the hard. Um, I often, um, when working on projects, particularly with collaborators, but in, in long form projects, try to come up with a set of tenants for a project in order to help guide how one goes about researching and then also thinking about how things fit together. And so this work in the desert has very much been about attention to time and duration, pacing and rhythm. And then um, also thinking um, really carefully about um, uh, the, the ideas of... Um, uh, No problem. Um, and so this uh, this sense of coming up with tenants that that uh, uh, they included things like attention to time and and also this interplay between like where what is hard and soft power, um, and that these are not necessarily located just with like the human and the non-human. Like there's soft power can include things like the um, you know the hot air rising off the desert that the um, that the turkey vultures kind of circle on, that they sort of cruise over. It can also be the dune that's sort of collapsing into, um, you know, into the city of Iquique. It feels like that city is just, you know, 10 years from having the dune just kind of consume it. And there's a way in which the desert sort of outlasts everything, like all of our desires and our longings and our failures, the desert will somehow outlast in some form. But there's also the hardness of it. Um, all of these salt formations, when you walk on them, they really sound like you're walking on broken porcelain. And we've done quite a lot of recording with their expansion and contraction, which creates a lot of cracking sounds, but then also kind of performing on them using different sorts of objects. So um, in the work to come, um, I was just there actually in May and June with uh, Rodrigo, my collaborator, and uh, we... Um, we will be um, creating um, both a, 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 a let's let's loosely call it an experimental film, and also I'm um, working on a longer form audio piece that really considers this outer space connection and um, and and really is trying to address these questions around industrial revolution 4.0 in the space. And so um, so we've taken uh, we really tried to figure out how to put ourselves into the space as well, um, both as people who are filming there and documenting, who are visitors, who are also sort of part of the problem. And, um, and particularly because a lot of these companies get money from Canadian mining uh, concerns. Um, some of the main mines are trading on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. Um, so I definitely feel like I have a kind of witnessing role to play in this, um, in, you know, in a global sense. Um, and at the same time, we're also, um, um, very much thinking about um, what multiple worlds can we evoke in this space, like, uh, again, a kind of endurance, resilience, um, metamorphosis, like we're not really trying to make a documentary exactly, although there's definitely documentary elements, um, but we're interested in metamorphosis, like how things seem to take other forms, how things can change from one thing to another. Um, sometimes just through slips of perception or through these, these sort of tricks of media, these ambiguities of media. Um, you probably noticed there's a few sounds in there that uh, I had also put into the very first piece that we listened to um, because that, that piece was really meant to sort of sample from some of the uh, things I've been working on in a, uh, in a transmission ecology sense. So this is, um, um, I really feel like these, these interplays between more lush spaces, more dry spaces, spaces that are industrially um, um, ruined to some degree, and also that are, you know, hold the, still hold the potential for their own endurance and their own metamorphosis. Um, these are all kind of coming together um, underneath, uh, let's say, this, this like umbrella of, of practice that's very much thinking about signal space, intimacies of, of 
the intimacies of distance, if I can take that kind of poetic liberty, and um, um, and and the notions of of um, um, extended extended experiences of time and duration. Um, so I think I will stop there, um, and and I'd be happy to take questions or to elaborate on anything and. Um, and and if we feel like there aren't burning questions, I also still have other audio I could play, but I, I will pause there. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, that was incredible, <laughs> really generous and um, and like fulsome and and full of process as well, which I think is great for everyone to to hear. Um, are you okay, Anna? Actually, do you need it? Like, we could take a five-minute break if you if you need it, or you okay? Oh no, I'm totally fine. Yeah, okay. great. I've been I've been drinking my tea here, so I'm <laughs> I'm still hydrated. <laughs> nice, and the, the the light has definitely changed in your environment. It's really interesting just seeing that slow change of, of light. It's lovely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's a very foggy morning out here. It's a super dense fog outside the window. So seems that somehow. Yeah, um, I, I'll go through some of the chat. Um, questions because there's quite a lot of um, different things and and then we can we can just go from there and I'm sure there'll be more questions um, going in um, so let me go right from the top I'll get through the wow and amazing bits and then um, so Robert actually Robert do you want to actually ask this question are you, are you with us still you don't have to I'll take that as a as I know. Um, Robert's first question was, this is very interesting and stirring. A um, little confused how the sounds are documented, transmuted to electronic waveforms. I don't know if Robert's still here, what work you're actually talking about there, but did that ring any bells for you, Anna, in terms of how to respond to something like that? Sure. Um, I think some of these, uh, let's see, around that time, that might have been um, when I was playing some of the pieces from the fog refrain um, and perhaps some some other relative pieces. Um, oh, the underground piece. OK, great. Yes. So, uh, well, it's this this piece was like a um, uh, because it was for a concert, like this online concert. I really felt like I had full liberty to make any any sort of uh, use any sort of instrumentation that I that I felt I wanted to. So there, there is a little bit of documentary sound um, of me walking around, crunching around in the under uh, in the uh, what's what what I even call it. it's not undergrowth because at that point everything is very much not not growing um, in this sort of mulchy mass of dried leaves and kind of desiccated earth and dust more or less um so that is part of the sound that you're hearing um i've i've played a little bit with pitch in a couple of ways um but i'm actually using electric sounds there like entirely electronic sounds to kind of create the world that i um i imagine being there because um even though i do have some some uh, microphones that are capable of recording some aspect of sounds underground. I was kind of interested in, in evoking the idea of like the quick insectoid, uh, the, the sort of the attention of the antenna, um, um, you know, the slightly aggressive, like <laughs> kind of feeling. Um, so I'm using a small synthesizer for that piece called a Tetrax, which is built by Peter Blazer, who's a um, synth designer who used to be based in Baltimore. I believe he's actually lived in Berlin for a chunk of time these days, but I'm, I'm not totally sure. Um, anyway, it's a much beloved instrument, um, a small cottage built synthesizer, which I play with. Um, um, it's it's just a, a touch sensitive instrument that you can kind of hot patch and it has tremendous improvisational capacity and I use that together with a series of outboard electronics so different kinds of pedals and um, and sometimes I also run route the signal through a small radio just to have an, a, a version of it that's very compressed by the um, by by the crappy speaker on that little radio. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a, a layering of that, and then also um, 
Um, usually when I'm playing a show, uh, I will have what I will leave whatever I had on 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 my looping pedals. I have some like live loopers that can save just some very small bits, and um, and I'll kind of leave the residue of whatever was there from the last show and kind of use it almost like the sourdough starter for the next show. And so there was this little kind of smooth little loop, and so I ended up kind of manipulating that as part of that section. So. Um, that came from just I don't even know what show so so the whole point was just to evoke more of an atmosphere um, but there's still this kind of you know it's based in a real place but it, I'm overlaying on it a bunch of my own impressions or my own imaginations about like how quickly or slowly other creatures might be responding to one another so thanks for that question that's great um, there was a comment, oh gosh, let me just find this again. I'm not sure what piece this was about, but the piece sounds like dehydration, tinnitus, okay. very interesting. Um, Reed, hey Reed, um, also asked, is there a way to watch a full screening? Um, I think that was the last uh, piece that we saw. Is that, that's, I guess that's not available to to view online? Uh, it? No, it's not at this moment, but um, but eventually it will be. There, there is uh, there's another piece. There's a 10 minute piece that um, um, here I'll put it in the chat that that we put into the Feral Atlas, which is the um, it's a it's an environmental humanities uh, publication through Stanford Press that was edited by Anna Singh and others. And it's a, um, a vast compendium of, of writing uh, based on um, uh, sort of deep field research by a number of different field researchers uh, thinking about the effects of the Anthropocene. And in particular, thinking of like the things that exceed human design. So, you know, in this case, it's not just the mines that dig a hole. And, it, it, you know, our, our, we made a, sh a short sort of 10 minute video called um, Overburden or We Are Surrounded by Torta which is um, dealing with all of the um, the kind of uh, uh, displacement of rubble and and dirt and earth that and and rock that gets pulled out of the mine and then gets packed into these kind of really distinctly shaped structures that can be incredibly massive, like the size of pyramids, um, some of which are are very toxic. Uh, because they're they're sort of it's a form of leach heaping in order to get like a very low grade of copper out of this this rubble, um, and some of which is just like the extra stuff that was in the hole that you have to remove in order to get to the the, the stuff that's a little bit higher um, quality, and so. Um, um, so that film it shows you both like the contemporary copper mining and the historical mining and, and the intention with that piece that is a, a much more documentary piece. These other things have, I, I would say, are a little more like based in document, but they're meant to be a bit more experimental. Um, but uh, but the we are, we are surrounded by Torta film in the, in the Feral Atlas is, is really meant, meant to question this idea that um, I, it it requires a, a certain kind of narrative before actions can be taken. And so in the desert, the narrative is this is a wasteland. And if it is wasted land, if we don't extract the, its value. So we must mine because otherwise it's just a waste of our resource. We didn't harvest it. And, um, and then by the same token, it becomes wasted land afterwards because it's made toxic. It's a sacrifice zone. It's made uninhabitable. It's filled with, you know, the air is full of arsenic. The groundwater is full of sulfur, like all of these sorts of um, um, uh, consequences like, do kind of in some ways transform the desert into what the narrative originally even suggested it was. And so trying to both uh, see the desert as someplace that is neither waste wasted or or a waste and at the same time to look at the ways in which the current um infrastructures and industry are laying to waste what is there is is like a weird sort of parallel uh thought process to try to keep like two sort of almost uh, oppositional ideas in mind at the same time and so the, um, these pieces all try to work with that like that incongruent feeling of both hope and despair and 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 tries to challenge this the the dominance or the singularity of of a capitalist narrative in order to to understand what what else is happening or how else things are working there Gosh, amazing um it's it's makes me think as well that you know copper and copper being such a kind of 
integral medium to sound technologies and the radio historically and it's kind of like revisiting that site as a as a site of of materiality and a site of it's kind of got this meta mining within the practice itself which is super yeah. interesting i think going on and I'm, i might come back to that actually a little bit later because i've got about a million questions to ask as well but we'll <laughs> see we'll see if we get to any of them um thank you for that so um i think teresa asked um what was the title of the very first piece um that was played just as a reminder oh right so that that came from an uh like a group installation project that was called on transmission um, and my little part of it is called in the air in the ground right um and i i haven't posted it anywhere at this time but i will eventually uh post that on some kind of publicly available media also if you are keen to hear it again just you can just email me i'm not i'm not like hiding it from the world exactly so i'm happy to share a link so great um and there's lots of people saying thank you and wonderful uh declan asks um about a piece on your website the solar radio could you mm -hmm. say a little bit about that Absolutely. So solar radio is a fairly new project. Um, I often work, I have a number of sort of long, long running collaborators and uh, absolute value of noise. Um, also known as Peter Cordemanche, who's like a very old friend of mine from Vancouver. Um, we were both at the same radio station at CITR radio and also um, at the Western front, which was an artist run center where Peter was um, a tech director there for a long time. And, uh, and, we uh, we we do a lot of long form radio pieces together, and this is in part because we both love love duration and love overnight radio. And and Peter also has um, the coding chops to create some some generative uh, software that allows us to um, to make to make pieces that are longer than our own attention span could possibly enable. So actually, we're working. We're just starting to work on a three hundred and sixty five day. Um, composition uh, with the help of some software but uh but so what uh what solar radio is about is it's kind of like the meeting of two projects so one is that peter was building a small um solar powered radio station at his house that he was uh, playing with um, for in order to to sort of work on on some other projects and it became a kind of it, its own piece very much just like uh no batteries in it it just it just is able to transmit when the sun is up and and the sun is strong enough and the notion there is that the um uh the the small artificial intelligence um it tries to respond to the sounds that are in its environment by you know responding tries to imitate those sounds um and then uh at the same time, he and I had made a different piece called Embodied Radio Device, which was sort of like the story about this artificial intelligence, imagining that there's some kind of future place where this creature exists and that it's listening to, you know, frogs and crickets and a, maybe a passing vehicle or something. But there aren't really a lot of people around. It's as if it's been forgotten. It's been kind of left somewhere. And uh, and so... Uh, I recorded sounds and created sounds, and then we also figured out what these some of these synthesis uh, synthetic sounds are that the creature, um, you know, would be making in response to those. And so, solar radio now has become a permanent installation as of just this last month at Wave Farm, which is a transmission arts center in the Upper Hudson Valley in New York State, and uh, it's it's installed on the property. It's on a, a kind of truss. Uh, really, really like a standard truss. You would you would put any sort of you know cell phone um, sort of tower transmission stuff on, or you know you could attach any old antenna to. Um, and it has small solar panels and and no batteries. So uh, so this artificial intelligence is responding to the environment at Wave Farm, and so we were just there for a week at the end of August, early September. Um, recording sounds um, from Wave Farm of like all of these, this incredible frog chorus, all of these electronic instruments that are, are in, uh, insects that are there that really sound like instruments. Um, and so the sounds that you hear during the day of solar radio, which you can listen to on the um, WGXC and uh, Wave Farm site, 
there's a stream so that when the solar radio, when the sun is up and the solar radio is on and the artificial intelligence is, is working, then um, um, then you hear what you hear is a mixture of sounds that I've uh, recorded or created together with the sounds that the AI makes. Um, and it, through the, the programming of the software, we have sort of set a lot of parameters based on like what time of year it is and what time of day it is. And, um, and so it's very much about um, uh, the creature sometimes remembering a sound from the summer. You know, we sort of imagine it sitting there in the winter remembering a frog as well as it's sort of um, you know, being it's surrounded by frogs because where it's sighted is definitely like near a pond that is can be a very loud place in the spring when it's raining. So, so that's the solar radio idea. It, it, it's a real thing, but it's also the imagination. It's also like a, a fictional story about a thing. So, um, that was maybe a little unclear, but but that's what it is. And you can listen to it when the sun is up if you go to Wave Farm. So. Right. I think that connects to the next question from Reed actually about um, thinking about time and duration as well and maybe deep time scales and um, Reed says um, I'm working on a collaborative film sound project about the Gulf Stream at the moment so this hit a real note for me in particular it got me thinking more about the pace of geology minerals used to enable electronic component production especially to regulate time it reminded me of AA Cargo by Solveig Zeus too thanks for joining some dots um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I mean, time is obviously a huge subject. <laughs> um, and and there's something like with your work that I think is wonderful in terms of like the multi multi scalar sense of time and uh, materiality that operates like it really stretches my listening, like when I listen to your works, which I, I kind of love that. And um, I was just thinking about like the demand, like on the back of Reed's question, like the demand of listening to for something like a durational radio, it feels like a really great like platform and scenario because of the, the sort of there's a demand for like a slow approach, like a slow listening approach um, with sound. Um, is do you, it's a hard question in a way. It's to do with like audience, I suppose, and like mm -hmm. how, how one comes to your work to listen. Is that what 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 do you hope to invite as a kind of listener from the other side? Are you are you do you want to give like the specific message or are you hoping to open up that long durational space? And, and I think this is a, a really hard, ambiguous question, but I think a lot of our students <laughs> grapple with it as well when they're trying to exhibit things. They're like, where's the listener in my piece? So um, could you say anything about that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a great question and it's definitely one that I grapple with a lot too. Sometimes I've made things for an imaginary listener, and I don't even know if anybody ever hears it because um, I've also, you know, done some pirate radio interventions where I, on purpose, sit right next to the, you know, the a, a large signal that I know people are tuning into. So, for instance, in Montreal, like to the uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation signal, like the CBC, which is not our national radio, but let's let's just say it's public radio at least, and. You know, I'll just be one point away from that um, broadcasting something. And do I know if anybody heard this? Like, if their signal was a little fuzzy, did they catch this this signal that's designed to sort of like sneak into a regular signal? I have no idea. So, so there's moments when you I make something completely for an imaginary listener, um, but often I feel like what I'm doing, especially in the radiophonic world, is that I'm trying to share listening. So I feel like I'm less about sharing content and I'm sharing listening. I'm sharing a quality of listening that I'm also trying to um, inhabit. And so for that reason, things, if they're, the tempo is kind of given by the needs of that listening or by the things that I've, I've noticed or the way in which I want to direct my own attention and therefore want to share that quality of attention with someone else. Um, so, uh, I feel like I learned a lot from working with dancers. Um, you know, when, when contemporary dance, uh, uh, uh choreographers or, or companies are, are devising a new work, often there are these sort of small prompts and then people begin working on, on different sorts of body movements, interactions with one another. And there's this, this, uh, ongoing thing of like the attention for when change should occur like what's the impulse for something to change and it can really come from like all of these possibilities like oh somebody somebody else improvises a particular movement and that gives gives uh 
you the the reason to to change what you're doing or or to be still or to move again. Um, but it can also be just like something within oneself, like when is my breath settled or when I don't know, like a, a, again, a quality of attention that that drives when the impulse for change comes. But I feel like I'm often thinking that way and it, looking for this sort of ephemeral feeling of like, what's the impulse for change instead of like rigid, more rigidly planning it out and saying, OK, this piece will wants to touch on these themes. So we're going to give like 10 minutes to this and 15 minutes to that and blah. I, I just feel like the logic of especially when I'm basing things on fieldwork, the logic of observation and listening gives the pace, gives the it, it, it gives the. Um, uh, a lot of my my kind of organizational decision making. So a lot of what I do is, uh, you know, if I'm out field recording, a lot of my recording is just like being there and then making notes later. So um, again, I sort of feel like I got this from dancers, like the body is a recording device. And so I tried to really trust that. And the things that fall away are also interesting. Like what are the little crumbs that stick with me and what are the things that seem to leave? And in terms of time, um, I think because I started off working with sound inside of the radio grid of like shows are a half an hour or one hour long, and you have to sort of telegraph to people what has happened if they're tuning in in the middle of the show, there's always this sense of a, a kind of itinerant listener and the pacing of, of being a little bit didactic. Um, for me, like my early experiences with micro radio and pirate radio were about throwing the clock out the window and, and trying to look for tempo and rhythm in other things. And, um, and also just trying to suspend time, like to escape the logics of the grid. So, uh, so then I think a lot about like, what sounds do that for me? Like, when does a sound create that suspension? So for instance, in this last piece I showed with the desert material, it's a pretty persistent, weird tone. But for me, I match that to the feeling I have when I'm under the sun in the middle of the day. And there's just a, a real like, like relentlessness to a certain kind of sound without it, you know, or, or a relentlessness of the sun without it being, um, you know, it's not such a hot desert. You're not suffering miserably, but it's very intense because it's there's so much UV. And so you have to cover up and you're really like, aware of the brightness and the, the density of like the sun's rays. And so I tried to also then think like, well, what kind of sounds fit this environment when I'm now composing? It's usually like, how can I make something that's dense or intense in the same way that that also has that weird sort of wavering, like, oh, you've always been here. You've never left this desert. This moment is forever, you know, and then and then it changes anyway. And it's like, again, what's the impulse for something to change? So so there's a real performativity, I guess, to the way that I do field work and to the way that I compose. Um, also in terms of thinking about, um, uh, you know, practically how that happens, I try to make as much sound outside of the computer as possible. And uh, the computer at this point, I'm using more like just to do very basic sequencing, mostly like mastering um, almost everything that I'm that I make for other pieces, I kind of perform them with my gear into the computer, and then and then I just I save these like little parts, um, like sort of like little segments, and then figure out how to play them. Um, so for the 22 hours, for instance, it was a mixture of live instruments, but I had also prepared some sort of performative chunks that I had made in the studio, but everything still had the same quality of like being performed and not being like minutely edited. Thank you. Um, Tom has a, a great question about the relationship to acoustic ecology. I think Tom's going to ask the question. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. Hey, Anna, thank you uh, for the talk. It's been very interesting. Um, I have a question. So how do you relate to the ambiguities between the sourcing of the materials for a field recording? equipment and the intentions of acoustic ecology. Um, so I guess like the idea that some of the truths about mining can only be revealed with um, certain technologies that come from that could come from the mine itself. Um, so yeah, is that attention for you and your practice? Um, maybe you can discuss that. Mm -hmm. 
Absolutely. No, I, the, the very last image, um, um, maybe I can just pull it up as a still here while I'm, see if I can do two things while I'm talking. Um, the very last image in this particular edit of, um, um, of Solar Evaporation, the, um, the installation I showed you is, uh, is of our gear. I don't know if you can see it here. So we we pulled out most of the gear we were using at that the, that particular trip and and placed it on on the desert, sort of on this the the the, the ground right next to where these mines are. So this section of of of, of uh, area that doesn't have all those sort of beautiful salt patterns because this is an area that's already been kind of scraped clean, um, and it's like our complicity. In, in this lithium scenario uh, with the copper mines kind of like over our shoulder. And so we have our drone kind of like zoom, you know, it starts from like quite high up and then like really zooms in onto the gear. Because um, we very much feel like we're, we're complicit in this. I mean, there is a, uh, uh, there's a way of thinking about the mine. Um, I mean, we're not only also looking at the exact sites of where uh, the mineral is extracted, we were also um, spending a lot of time these last two trips um, following the power lines, the water pipelines, the um, the train that and the trucking that brings like copper and sulfur and such to the coast, these like weird areas of um, smelting and um, refining, um, also, there's a lot of sort of uh, extra elements like there's molybdenum and, you know, other kinds of, of um, um, elements that are that are pulled out of, uh, of the ground because of this process. And those go to these private deep water ports where everything gets shipped to China and goes directly to factories that are then, you know, making all of our devices. And so we're sort of following all of the tendrils of this infrastructure, like the tremendous amount of dumping that happens in the desert of all sorts of weird stuff, just because there's so much like industrial carelessness, um, you know, the way roads are built, um, et cetera. And so um, our one of our sort of our, our thesis around this, which I think also does, does relate a lot to acoustic ecology and these thoughts about um, how qualities of listening influence how the world is made. Um, in this case, we think very much about like how infrastructural systems create a, a kind of um, um, like a like a global mine um, or or what uh, uh, some a scholar has called the planetary mine. And, and that is that the, the mine itself isn't uh, some outpost and the city is the center. It's actually quite the opposite. It's like the mine is enmeshed inside of this web of, of global um, capital and, uh, and global infrastructures, often which are built and operated kind of at the level beyond statecraft, like they're not in the, in the level of nation because we're dealing with free trade agreements. And, and once international pipelines and roads are put in, it's extremely difficult to get rid of them or to change any of those things because smaller countries, smaller economies get sued, you know, by large global corporations for billions of dollars to replace sort of lost profits, et cetera. So, so very much our project is to try to think of the mine as, as part of an ecology of mining that is actually global and is not just a single point. And so the quality of our listening is to attend to that as much as we can. Um, so in that case, um, that also includes us and our gear. Um, there's sort of no way around that. One of the things we've um, talked about doing is, well, uh, well, what, the other thing I haven't really mentioned is that in, in the future film about this mining project, um, we are also including ourselves in the image. And so we have sort of two different modes. One is when we're just like the people who are out filming, wearing our protective gear and just like holding microphones and wearing headphones. And the other is us like uh, wearing what I've I've called an earth suit. So instead of a space suit, I made this earth suit for us, which is like a fully head to toe knitted garment and also like a woven garment made out of like Andean wool, like locally sourced wool. And then I wove the outer garment out of like plastic and twine and cassette tape and junk that we found. Um, and and I'm placing antennas, you know, in, you know, used from sort of re recuperated copper and um, 
And in, and when we're in that mode, we don't record anything. We just are sensing. We're kind of using old equipment. We're recycling and we're just sensing our environment and we're no longer kind of recording it in the same way. So we're definitely trying to deal with the tension that our presence sort of necessarily introduces to the project. Like the, we're definitely not um, outside of the planetary mind. Let's put it that way. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. That was really great. Thanks, Tom. Um, I, I need to see this Earth suit. <laughs> <laughs> That's just far too intriguing. Um, there's a, an interesting comment that um, Laura put up saying, thank you, so rich, and like thinking about like the economies, eco and of listening that are in radio and made, makes me think about Fran Francis Dyson and you know, ecology, mm. economy coming together, and it feels really strong in in um, in your work. We've got we've not got much time. I sort of wanted to like dial dial backwards a little bit, just in and, and into a sort of almost like a like how did you get into radio as a sort of start point, as a sort of historical um, thing within your life or practice? Like when 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 did that come into being, and and how you know? Uh, I mean, I have this kind of like uh, origin story, I guess now, which is that, you know, when I was a kid, my mother who was, um, who had moved to Canada from Denmark, um, she, she listened to the radio all the time when she was at home. She's also a weaver and a craftsperson. So she had to spend a lot of time seated at the loom and, and, you know, working on projects and, and that sort of thing. So even from the time I was really small, um, in a way, like the day was measured out by her carrying the transistor radio around listening to CBC radio from Canada. And, um, and I could hear the sort of what I knew what time of day it was based on who was on the radio and, you know, hearing the kind of repetition of the, uh, the news and that sort of thing. Um, so, so the radio was really ambiently in my life from the time I was small. Um, although my brother has not had the same, you know, he became an engineering geologist. He didn't become a radio artist. So um, I guess you can say it's like, it doesn't, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. Um, so I always knew that I wanted to be using my voice. I always knew that radio was someplace I was very interested to be in, but I just didn't want to make like a news program where I just, I just didn't see myself fitting into conventional radio very well. Um, so I was excited for community radio and when the opportunity came for me to join a community radio station because, you know, I started at the university and realized like, oh, they're taking volunteers, that could be me. So, um, so when I joined CITR radio with four of my friends and said, hi, we want to start a feminist talk show. Uh, and we were just like, they were so thrilled to have us, they like, tumbled us onto the air within two weeks and I was sitting in front of the board and barely knew which button to push and it was, you know, kind of an intimidating situation. Um, but I just very quickly felt like, oh, this is the, the environment I've been looking for all along that combines all of these possibilities for me, because, you know, I didn't go to art school or music school. I don't have any of that training. I'm trained in the social sciences. Um, but I kind of found my way, uh, to making sound and, uh, and now films and, and other sorts of things because of, working with my peers and collaborating with more senior artists and uh, learning through doing, which was very much like the world of community radio and, and artist run culture in Canada, especially in the nineties. Like there's no way I had, I didn't have a computer. I couldn't even, and I couldn't even afford a reel to reel player. Like I had to go somewhere where that gear existed. And, um, and for me working in radio, first of all, was really like the place where all of those possibilities could come together. Like the imaginary, the storytelling, um, something literary, but also I, I like improvising, you know, I don't write my texts beforehand, I just improvise them. So um, radio kind of gave me all of that comfort, that, that sort of opportunity. And then, uh, and then as soon as I started making my own little transmitters and could move the radio outside of the studio, then I realized like, oh, now we're actually out in the world. So I don't have to be kind of encased inside of a studio practice, I can really make work anywhere. And that's, still my approach that's great i think that's brilliant for people to hear as well thank you for sharing that um we've got one last question which could could lead to a huge answer potentially but it's about the um the useful radio term mm. and um the place of labor boris is asking um i'm fascinated by what you called useful radio the place of labor air traffic control 
uh, talk, talking via walkie-talkies. What's your approach when recording these sounds? Are you considering it as a political act? Um, I have a feeling that it could be felt as an intrusive technique. Um, and then there's more about the ethics of the practice in general and field recording in general, which is a book mm -hmm. itself. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you're, I, I was fascinated by that as well. I was thinking about the permissions and the mm -hmm. access and whether it's open source and that, that type of thing as well within that. So, yeah. Well, first of all, I want to put a shout out to my, uh, my my colleague Rick Prellinger, who's the one who's kind of coined this term useful radio, um, which he's sort of building off of, uh, I believe, the work of Charles Ackland, who's a film professor at Concordia University in Montreal. Um, Charles writes about useful cinema, which is, um, you know, these kind of educational films, like films that don't sort of fall under the kind of world of entertainment and more under the sense of like, you know, showing someone how to do something like a safety film, for instance, or like a pedagogical film or something that's corporate. And so Rick thinks of uh, useful radio very much of this like two way radio world. Um, and, and for me, it just offered this great opportunity to, um, to, to, to think beyond again, the notions of broadcast, which are like typically in, um, um, described as being like the singular antenna tower that radiates out to all of the listening audience members. Um, Two-way radio is a much smaller assumed listening listenership, but these are open channels. These are open frequencies. They're not encoded. They're not, um, you know, people know that others are listening in. So their, their, their coworkers can listen, their managers can listen, like everybody knows it's a public space, but um, the fact that it's, uh, that it is, you know, they're running at three in the morning, they're assuming that not a lot of people are, are necessarily listening, but the people using these channels are aware that they're not private, they're not, um, they're not encrypted. Um, there are, of course, many kinds of useful radio that are encrypted, in which case you are on a closed channel. But I see it kind of along the same way that, you know, because I'm a, a professor at a public university in, in the United States, then, you know, my email, for instance, is kind of like a, a public channel. Nobody needs to do anything special to request to see an email that I wrote because I'm a public employee. Um, it's that's that's maybe like a, it feels like it's personal, but it's not. But maybe it's sort of in the same way that like speaking over a, a, an open um, UHF EHF channel is, is also kind of both public and assumed to be not of interest to the broader public and so probably not um, recorded. But one thing in here in the United States is that there are so many radio nerds who are busy recording every channel that's around. So one of the ways that I was able to listen to some of this stuff without actually sitting, you know, in Oakland uh, every night at three in the morning is that somebody else is monitoring that uh, feed and has it running on their shortwave all the time. So it's possible just to tune in and listen um, in the same way that like air traffic control and these other channels, those are also uh, published live through an air traffic control um, uh, website. So I feel like these things which are public um, are fair game for me to work with. Um, um, and uh, and I think in terms of field recording and, and recording radio, I am aware that there, there are some things I wouldn't use. Like for instance, I'm very careful if I'm listening on a police scanner, I, you know, and, and even when I'm using the, the material from the BART channel, as soon as they start talking about an individual person, like I might leave in like the comment when someone says, oh, we have an overdose, but I will never use the, um, any identifying information that, you know, who that person is or where, where in the system that's taking place. Like I definitely don't want to be um, engaged in something that's just like a spectacle of someone else's misery or or someone else's like you know difficult engagement with authority, especially here. And the, you know the U.S. Uh, for instance, like the San Francisco area police during the uprisings in in 2020, they were just on their radio, un, unencrypted channels that they know lots of people listen to. They're just reading people's driver's licenses. They're just like saying all sorts of private personal stuff. And I just can't believe that that's legal or allowed. And I would definitely never use that kind of information in a piece. I just feel like that's way out of line. Um, so in terms of recording other things, yeah, I, I, I don't I don't record everything that I listen to. That's often why I'm figuring out like what sounds can I make that evoke that place or evoke that feeling rather than using like 
that sound from exactly that place. So, um, so yeah, it's definitely an, each project has its own set of, of limitations or freedoms around this, but it's definitely something I'm thinking about. Yeah, I, I love those sequences. I think we'll have to finish now, but um, those sequences, the, the, there's such a lovely play of like truth and fiction in your your works when I listen to them and those those kind of useful radio snippets as well. They're, they are, they're these reminders that often truth is stranger than fiction as well somehow, like that the, the, the real is just full of performative, fictive kind of energy and agency and, and uh, I love that. But we've gone over and um, I should let you have your day back. <laughs> and uh, and um, I just want to say like, thank you hugely. Also, I think this is quite inspiring for a lot of our students who are, um, we're, we're for the first time ever, we're kind of, there is an option to do um, what we're calling an audio paper rather than mm. traditional written dissertation. And your work will be very inspiring for our students who are gonna take that option um, because there's something, you know, brilliantly critical creative and essayistic within um, your work so we're, we're we're pushing your work to our students quite quite massively on this um experiment really of what an audio paper can be rather than a traditional written dissertation so um i just wanted to let you know that um fantastic yeah yeah but, i mean we we definitely have a critical practice phd here where um, our students are always engaged in making and writing and i'm trying to encourage people to really think outside the box on both of those. It's like art making is not just the object of theory. Like these are, these are again, they're parallel worlds that can synthesize with one another. And so, you know, writing is also a creative act and bringing them together and as like sound papers, I think is really fantastic. And again, I kind of credit radio with being so sort of genre fluid that this was possible to try. Um, and um, anyway, so I, if, if, folks want to reach out if you have questions or things you want to share I'm always happy to hear from you so thank you again Anna thank you so much that was brilliant and thanks everyone for the great questions and see you next week <laughs> thanks so much for having me it's been a pleasure I think we need to do some digital claps if I can find my reaction button <laughs> there we go <laughs> see you soon thanks very much Anna